Hello, and welcome to History is Gay, a podcast that examines the underappreciated and overlooked queer ladies, gents, and gentle NBs that have always been there in the unexplored corners of history, because history has never been as straight as you think. everyone. Welcome back to History is Gay. I'm Lee Pfeffer, your host, and I am joined today by our lovely guest co-host who always comes in clutch with the best topics to talk with me about, Aubrey Calvin again. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me back. That is like the nicest intro that I have to disagree with. But it's what so you- good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's really lovely. I uh, This is a topic that I've been wanting to do for a while, and you were super game for it. And Well, yeah, because every time I've come on, I've had to talk politics. And <laughs> yeah, I teach politics, and I kind of wanted a break from it. So I said, yeah. let's do my favorite thing, books. Heck yeah. Yeah, so we're coming back from hiatus. I'm figuring out exactly what things will look like for the next phase of History is Gay. But in the meantime, Aubrey and I are coming back with a couple of episodes on this topic because there are just so many people that we couldn't fit them all into one. We are talking about classic children's literature that, surprise, surprise, all your favorites are queer. (laughs) (laughs) so many classic kid lit is written by a bunch of gamos so there you have it we're gonna be covering a small smorgasbord of authors today and then in our next episode we'll come back with some more so this episode will be a little bit different we're gonna start the conversation and then we will pick up in our next episode and you know we're doing classic ones because A lot of the authors we're looking at are from a time before social media was such a big deal, before we seem to know every detail about everyone's lives. And the authors kind of separated themselves and their personal lives from the books instead of nowadays where just about every publisher expects authors to go on Twitter or Instagram to promote themselves and promote their books. This is a more of a different kind of format for how books used to be sold. Yeah, definitely. So it was easier for us not to know much about the authors. And I just kind of feel a little bit nostalgic for that time period. (laughs) Yeah, both of us kind of uh, social media lurkers slash gremlins were like, God, I wish I didn't have to like be on social media. So yeah, so this episode is going to be the first of a multi-parter. And we will be going through a group of folks and then picking up the next episode with another group and going through our pop culture tie-ins and all of that in a future episode. Content warnings. There will be some discussion about internalized and external homophobia, some mental health struggles, some mentions of suicide or suicide attempts. I think that's it. So today we're going to be covering four people. We're going to talk about Tommy DePaola, Margaret Wise Brown, Arnold Lobel, and Anne N. Martin. And if you don't know those author names, I can guarantee you, you know some of their work. Yes. You know them by their work. So let's start. And because the idea that children's literature is such a broad, topic or a broad concept, we wanted to mention that we're basically talking about, for the most part, picture books, smaller books that focus more on illustration rather than a chapter format. With the exception of Anne M. Martin, who had chapter books, most of what we're talking about are more about learning how to read, more emphasis on illustration. And that's where we're at for this episode. Yeah. If you are Gen X or a millennial, probably or at least, you know, some some early Gen Z, these books may have been a staple of your childhood. And it's really edifying to come to the realization that all of these beloved books that we had when we were growing up were written by queer people in a landscape where there was not able to be any queer representation or really, for the most part, even hinting in queer kids lit. So let's talk just like a little bit about what children's literature (laughs) looked like at this time. 
Nothing queer, <laughs> pretty much. Like that's 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 I mean, the gist. Eighteen hundreds, seventeen hundreds, early <laughs> early nineteen hundreds. Of course, the writing and the books and the focus was different. Uh, one thing you found was that the first what would be considered young adult novel to depict a queer encounter was "I'll Get There, It Better Be Worth It" by John Donovan, and that was from nineteen sixty nine. And yeah, that's one that like- I don't think I've ever heard of. Me neither. This was a this was a new thing that I found for myself. But yeah, it was the first before YA was like a category, but like a young adult novel that depicted any sort of homosexual encounter was this book. And I, I wanted to put this in just kind of as a preface because it's worth noting that there is kind of a, a silent biography that will be running through almost all of the people that we're talking about, which is a woman named Ursula Nordstrom, who was an editor at the head of juvenile fiction at Harper and Brothers, which became Harper and Row. So many of the people that we are covering in, in mul- these multiple episodes, they had a relationship with this woman who really put these authors on the map. She encouraged their writing and their career careers, and she really had a passion for developing and discovering new talent. So this era of children's books, you know, from the 50s to 70s, really was encouraged by this one woman who was a lesbian herself. It reminds me, honestly, a lot of, like, Xena having a lesbian producer behind the scenes in Liz Friedman and kind of pulling the strings and rubbing her gay little hands all over everything and <laughs> putting these these gay and queer authors out into this industry. She lived openly with her partner, Mary Griffith. She wrote and published a book called The Secret Language in 1960 that was... Uh, This is a little bit of an aside, but it was about an eight-year-old girl in a boarding school who had, like, her best friend was just the butchest little girl named Martha. And this so-called, like, secret language that they come up with has uh, a word called libosa, which means (laughs) when something is just lovely. And no less than three articles I looked at quipped somehow about how that basically is just got to be a coded word for lesbian. So Yeah, it just it's a bit too on the nose. But if you don't know, you don't know. Right. And I think I'd read this book maybe years ago. But really? I, like when I was like maybe mid 80s. So I remember almost nothing about it. But I remember this sounds familiar, I guess. Yeah. But. I mean, who can remember all the books you read from back then, you know? And, you know, surprise, surprise, like, even that book that we mentioned, uh, Donovan's I'll Get There, It Better Be Worth the Trip, was published by Nordstrom. Uh, I found this really great quote from her saying, I had for years also said that I wished somebody would write a book that would just give a hint that there could be a romantic feeling between two persons of the same sex. It happens to almost everybody when they're growing up. A crush on a teacher or something, and they outgrow it, or they don't outgrow it. Unbeknownst to me, John Donovan wrote me a letter and said he was writing a book about the different varieties of love. And he sent me, I'll get there, it better be worth the trip. So I just really love kind of prefacing this whole conversation. There are always people behind the scenes. It's so easy to focus on the person whose name is on the book or the director of the film. But we always have to remember that there's always people behind the books that are pushing a lot of these things forward. And they never get enough credit because it's just their job to them. But their name isn't on the cover of the books for the most part. Yeah. So you can really thank Ursula Nordstrom for a lot of these. Her name's going to come up a lot. She truly is the gay fairy godmother of classic children's lit. Another thing really important to note is just that children's sexuality in general is non-existent in children's literature. So it's not even just that specifically queer content was removed. It's that there is a tendency for there to be a complete sexlessness in depiction of children's lives in these books. And so there's a a great book, Over the Rainbow, Queer Children's and Young Adult Literature by Michelle Ann Abate and Kenneth Kidd. And they have a great quote that just says, there's this prohibition against the representation of any sexuality, much less queer sexuality in early childhood. But there's also... Subtext. (laughs) There's also subtext. And this Kid lit historian Philip Nell basically just says that there's a silenced history of LGBTQ authors in this sphere. And he says, someone should write a book. I think uh, <laughs> we got one we got from one. Over the Rainbow. There you go. We got one. Great. So 
Let's dive into our first person. So we're going to talk about people's lives. Aubrey, why don't you start us off with Tommy DePaola? I do like Tommy DePaola. I read, remember reading a lot of his books to my kid when they were really little. So his books were pretty prominent in my child's little book collection. So we have Thomas Anthony DePaola, or Tommy, or Tommy, as he was more well-known, was born September 15th, 1934, in Meridian, Connecticut. His father was a barber, and his mother was a homemaker, and they were a very close-knit family. Uh, Many of his picture books were set in the Italian region that his grandparents came from, and part of that closeness is because they grew up during the Great Depression and World War II in a house that didn't have a lot of television, only a radio. And you do read about this a lot from a lot of families during this Great Depression, World War II era, where all they really had was each other. And sometimes that worked out really, really well, and sometimes it wasn't great. But for Tommy, it was actually pretty good. His family loved books, and they put a huge emphasis on reading and creativity. Yeah, according to one source, he once commented, I had what I can only consider the good fortune to be exposed to radio, and I never missed that wonderful Saturday morning show, Let's Pretend. I have always felt that that particular program, plus the fact that my mother was in love with books and spent many long hours reading aloud to my brother and me, were the prime factors that caused me to announce to my first grade teacher that when I grew up, I was going to make books with pictures. Mm, I do love that. You see a lot of these folks really early on kind of knowing what they wanted to do. But we also end up seeing that there's quite a few of them that had some conflicting relationships with the fact that they were children's authors. But we'll get into that later. Yeah. My mom taught me how to read when I was three. So I really identify a lot with that quote that the love of books is sometimes just taught as a part of family life in a way that isn't even intentional. It's just what people found entertaining. And so my mom taught me how to read when I was three and my siblings as well. So I do resonate with that quote. Yeah. He, you know, has frequently said that, like, from the age of four, he knew he wanted to be an artist. He said, I must have been a stubborn child because I never swayed from that decision. And he had a good support network. Uh, His family and teachers encouraged his artistic pursuits. People would give him art supplies as gifts for his birthdays and holidays And it just really instilled in him this love and this passion really early on. So in 1952, he started at the Pratt Institute, graduating in 1956. And his emphasis there was art, theater, illustration. And after graduation and before starting his illustration career, he spent six months at a Benedictine monastery. It's wild. Yeah, which I understand graduating college and not really knowing what you want to do with your life. But to spend six months, I don't know if he was training, if he was studying, or just like an artist in residence. Uh, But he was there for six months. And he says, although he left, spirituality was always a big part of his career. And he incorporated some broad spiritual values into his art his whole career. I mean, he's certainly not the first queer Benedictine monk, as we learned many, many years ago in one of our first episodes. An opportunity to be around a bunch of other guys? What? (laughs) No, that wouldn't Uh, appeal to anybody. uh, So yeah, like many young adults, Tommy's post-college time involved a variety of small artistic jobs. He did mural painting, staging theater sets, designing greeting cards. But by the 1960s, his career settled into kind of a blend of teaching at various colleges, illustrating other authors' works, and then eventually writing and illustrating his own. Yeah, because, you know, children's illustration, for most people, it's never been something to sustain a career. Unless you're you're just doing it prolifically in your early stages, you're not making that much money off of these books. So you have to do something else. His first illustration debut came in 1965 with the science book Sound, written by Lisa Miller. In 1966, he published his first written and illustrated book, The Wonderful Dragon of Timlin, which was a story about a gentle dragon that loves strawberry ice cream sodas and seeks shelter with a princess and a page to avoid a confrontation with the knight that is after him. I remember reading this book, just like like a soft, gentle dragon. It just like, it reminds me a lot of Ferdinand the Bull, you know? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And you, this is a theme a lot in his work, just kind of flipping these masculine, hyper-masculine expectations and traits on their heads and just really showcasing gentle boys, gentle men 
male characters. Yeah, there's a lack of confrontation and there's a lack of aggressiveness where usually the characters are trying to find peaceful resolutions or trying to find ways to help the community and they're often misunderstood. So if you can, it's a wonderful book. You can find it online and I think there are a few YouTube videos of people reading it. So check it out. In 1967, DePaula moved to California. He taught at the San Francisco College for Women and at the time earned an MFA from the California College of Arts and Crafts in 1969 and his doctoral equivalency in fine arts from Lone Mountain College in San Francisco. And from 1965 until his death in 2020, he worked as an illustrator or an author on over 270 books. I think almost every single one of the people we're going to talk about across these episodes has at least 100 credits to their name, which is bananas to think about. And his books have sold over 25 million copies. Yeah. One of my favorite things about him, and this is just because I'm a huge Muppets nerd, is that he was not one to kind of shy away from trying new things. Like he did guest appearances on other kids shows like Barney and the like. But in 2001, Tommy Up played himself in a puppet live action show called Jim Henson's Telling Stories with Tommy DePaula. It was a one season show where he and his puppet friends will tell stories from his previous books and encourage kids to create their own stories. So there's a Muppet tie in there, which I just think is so cute. <laughs> yeah, the show also allowed the palette to feature other children's writers as show guests. And unlike, you know, how long Reading Rainbow lasted for decades, this one only lasted for one season. And I guess it was something through Hallmark, the Hallmark Channel and Disney. Oh, uh, crazy. Yeah. So it was like originally for like, original content for the new Hallmark Channel back in the day. But it was a chance for some of his more famous literary characters to be recreated in Muppet form. Technically puppet, but in my mind, anything Jim Henson's workshop counts as a Muppet. Um, yeah, and he Star Wars has Muppets. Yes, absolutely. And he has a page on the Muppet Wiki. So in my mind, that is Muppet territory. Tommy DePaola is a Muppet. Well, the characters. If he's on the Muppet Wiki, he is a Muppet. I mean, yeah, the characters. <laughs> like, like Strega Nona is a, here's a Muppet of her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, well, s speaking of Stringanona, his his stories, like Aubrey was mentioning, were often retellings of like Irish and folk tales and classic fairy tales. He did a lot of Mother Goose rhymes, religious and holiday books, but he's also known to produce, you know, very silly, gentle books about just everyday difficulties that kids face. Really important developmental milestones or life events like the death of a family member or dealing with like being bullied. And a lot of these things kind of pulled from his own childhood, including a book called 26 Fairmount Avenue, which he won the Newbery Honor for. But his I'd say probably his most famous works was the the Strega Nona series. You know, if you are like, who the heck are we talking about? Now you will know. If you ever read Strega Nona, that's who we're talking about. Yeah. So this was first published in 1975 about an Italian grandmother who's like a witch-like figure who helps her yeah, village with kinda, her kinda magic pot. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Like, in fact, he was saying how in a lot of these other cultures, there was this always like a grandmother witch that had... Mm -hmm magical porridge and things like that. And he would change his to pasta because of his Italian heritage. But she would be someone that would help her village with her magic. And she had this assistant, Big Anthony, who was sometimes the cause of some of the problems. And sometimes he became the star of some of the later books. The first book itself won the Caldecott Honor in 1976. And this is a series he would come back to every once in a while at adding more Strega Nona books. And when he ended it in 2013, between 1976 and 2013, he had done 12 of these books. That's a long series. I mean, I mean, not in like the number of books, but that is a long running series. We just keep coming back to it, you know? Yeah. yeah, to be putting out new books 30 years from the start of the first one is pretty remarkable. Yeah, just, you know, kind of continuing these character stories and learning more about them. So... These Strega Nona books have won just about every major literary award possible. They got the Smithsonian Medal from the Smithsonian Institute. It won the original Art Show Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of Illustrators, in which uh, Tommy was a big part of the Society of Illustrators. It won the Caldecott Honor, the Newberry Honor, what's called the Children's Literature Legacy Award, which was previously called the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award, but 
Laura oh, Ingalls yeah. Wilder is quite problematic in problematic. her own right. Uh, from the and all of those are from the American Library Association. So love the ALA. Yes. Yeah, there's a quote from a New Yorker article in 2020 after De Paula had passed from a journalist named Naomi Fry who spoke about the power of his books. She said, "Quote, the books have an unusual emotional and artistic power. Even under the best circumstances, navigating one's way through childhood can be brutal, like clearing a path in a jungle's thicket." De Paola's visual and writerly voice, clear-eyed, sympathetic, gently sly, felt like coming across an ally with who to brave that jungle. Yeah. And after he passed, a lot of the literary sites had authors write small eulogies and obituaries about him. And the author Lynn Oliver said, Tommy often said that an artist creates beauty in his own life, not just in his work. He practiced that to full effect, creating his yearly exquisite Christmas trees, wearing unique scarves and glasses, crafting his homemade pizza dough, building his beautiful sitting room, looking out on his flower-filled meadows. To be in his presence was a treat for the eye and the senses. Then add to that the contagious ring of his robust laughter, and you have a recipe for the perfect friend. Oh, that's really sweet. We really don't know a whole lot about his later life because he was pretty private and low-key. Um, he lived in New Hampshire much of the later part of his life, and he actually really tragically passed away March 30th, 2020, in the middle of the height of COVID in Lebanon, New Hampshire, from surgical complications after he fell and suffered a serious head wound. I think he was like doing something, like putting something up in his house, and he fell. Yeah, his death was quite sudden and it was quite a tragedy and it kind of shook the children's literary world. For like all of April and May afterwards, you could just find so many tributes and so many great stories from authors and bookstore owners and publishers about just the personal connections that they had with them. So there was just too much to include in here, but the love for him within the writer community is just very beautiful. Yeah. All right, so let's go to our next person. Let's talk about Margaret Wise Brown. This is somebody you may not know the name of, but you certainly you've read know. the book. You yeah, don't know. So it. You don't know if it, you, you don't know if you know it, but you've read the book. <laughs> you don't know if you know it, but you've read it. Is so she is the author of possibly some of the most acclaimed picture books: The Runaway Bunny and Goodnight Moon. She has been referred to as the Laureate of Nursery. She published over 100 kids' books. She was eccentric, rich, and a messy bisexual icon who loved dogs, horses, and rabbits. So, she was born May 23rd, 1910 in Brooklyn, New York. She was the middle child and very clearly had, like, middle child syndrome. Hey. Um, <laughs> It's I'm not a, a bad thing. I'm a middle you child. Just very, wait, wait. You just very much. <laughs> uh, she had so she had an older brother and a younger sister. Her parents were wealthy but not super attentive. They always fought. Kind of ignored their kids. She was of that era where it was just kind of like let's send you off to boarding school. So she basically spent her youth in a bunch of different boarding schools while her parents were like traveling. She, unlike some of these other folks, did not initially think about becoming a children's book author. She actually had big dreams of becoming the next great American novelist. Some of her idols were Gertrude Stein, Virginia Woolf, very gay. Um, she was a tomboy. She had like a rebellious streak. She got in trouble a couple of times for like skipping out on school or like missing curfew. She was also an avid beagler and equestrian. So what is like, a rich? What's a beagler? Like using like using beagles to like hunt foxes. And oh, stuff. okay. See, I grew up yeah. on military bases. We're like you know working class military military <laughs> so, folks. So you we, hear I wasn't bugler? A, I wasn't a beagler. I'm like I don't know what that is. So. Yeah, it, <laughs> Rich white lady shit. Okay, all right. <laughs> it, it's like like rich white lady shit. Ah, uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, she graduated in 1932 from Holland's College in Roanoke, Virginia, where she studied English, and then she moved to Manhattan to pursue a writing career. But her short stories weren't really getting a lot of traction from publishers, so she started teaching. She was working for a place called Bank Street Cooperative School in New York City in 1935 
And that's actually where she started writing children's books. She was working with an editor there and a teacher there who had kind of created this new like style of children's literature or teaching using literature that was called like Here and Now. And it was this philosophy of emphasizing the real world in kid lit and education, which at the time the industry was... The focus was was on fairy tales, fables, kind of the imagination, if you will. Exactly. And so this school really started bringing in, let's talk, let's use the real world and real experiences to connect with kids. Yeah. So she sold her first manuscript to Harper and Brothers in 1938 called When the Wind Blew. And it was about a woman who lives by the sea with a bunch of cats, which... Very gay. Very gay. Uh <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, so that, um, you know, this first manuscript led to her being hired as W.R. Scott's first editor. He was a very prominent children's literature publisher. He published several other books through his imprint, W.R. Scott Publishing House. And what was really fun was during this, she actually was like tasked with recruiting other contemporary authors to write children's books for his company. And she got the opportunity to recruit Gertrude Stein, who was like her hero, to write a children's book. The cynical part of me is just convincing these contemporary authors that, you know, kids books sell really well. And your last literary book was great and got great acclaim and no one bought it. So these children's (laughs) books sell really, really well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, She herself had a hugely prolific body of work. She wrote over 100 books in her lifetime, some written under pseudonyms, such as Timothy Hay, Golden MacDonald, uh, Juniper Sage, and some weren't published until after her death. Throughout her writing career, she had four main publishers, Harper & Brothers, later Harper & Row, W.R. Scott, Doubleday, and Little Golden Books. The Doubleday books were written under her Golden McDonald pseudonym, which there's a fun story from that. She basically stole that name from one of her lover's handymen that she met during her summer's vacationing in Maine, which we'll talk about in a moment. But she, if you, rem- I don't know if you remember those like little golden books. They're like really thin, like cardboard. They've got the little like gold little strip on the side. And they were a bunch of just like classic nursery rhymes mm-hmm. story, you know, they're so great. I think they're still around. Yeah, they're fantastic. So she wrote several of those during the 1950s. So many. This isn't related Um, to books, but I found the cutest little golden books themed purse that I wanted to buy. And I didn't because I found myself going, where would I use that? Everywhere. Little golden books are just iconic, you know? Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, she would be writing up to like five books a year and ideas Came pretty quickly and easily for her. She would be writing on any spare scrap of paper that she had. You know, apparently she wrote the whole story of Runaway Bunny on a ski receipt. Again, rich white lady shit. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, but, But she would like, she was really meticulous and would spend years polishing and editing. So she'd like write the story initially in like 20 minutes and then spend like two years before it was published. She frequently collaborated with an illustrator named Clement Hurd, who also had worked with Gertrude Stein. And her biggest hits, you know, even though she she wrote like over 100 books, her biggest hits and instant classics were The Runaway Bunny, which was 1942, and Good Night Moon, 1947. She tried to orient herself from the perspective of kids in her writing. She often said that she wasn't so much an author as she was like an ear to listen. And the kids really authored her stories. And she pulled a lot from dreams and childhood memories. She was very into like dream interpretation and psychology. And she would really just kind of like try to get ground's eye view of what being in a kid's mind was like. So it sounds like it's just that general idea that, you know, Kids' thoughts mattered. Kids' dreams mattered. So I grounded in reality, but the kid imagination is important, but there's that sense of reality to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So fun fact, and I discovered <laughs> this uh, by listening to a different podcast and reading about it. There is a huge figure in the world of children's libraries 
named Anne Carol Moore. Uh, she actually established the children's libraries for the New York Public Library. So she became a huge figure in the idea of what books were acceptable. And she had this huge reputation of the books that she liked were books that publishers gravitated towards or books that would get stocked in children's libraries. And she absolutely hated Good Night Moon. And she refused no one knows to let why. she refused to let it be put in any New York Public Library children's libraries. And this was when it had been a bestseller and popular, and people would always request Goodnight Moon. She would not let the library buy it until 1972. Yeah. She, it's... That's any, 25 years after it was published. That's a huge... 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find anything about exactly why she hated I it. I think she, it just, the, she just thought... I think it's like the whole... It was whimsy the style. Of it. I think it was like the whimsy of it or something. Yeah she, yeah, she thought it was like inane and just kind of stupid. And it was just like this this one woman's personal vendetta against this book being against her personal taste meant that people in New York could not get this book until 25 years after it was published. Yeah. In but, libraries. But since it got published in 72, it's been checked out over 100,000 times. Jesus. So I was like, like she's like, it's just one of these things like, you know, where like Moore herself was so influential in the idea of children's libraries. And she's got a little bit of controversy that we don't want to go into here. But it's funny how one major figure can just not care for another major figure. And I just find that hilarious. I just can't believe that it was as late as like, like when I first read that it was like banned from children's libraries. I was like, oh, okay. For like a couple of years. No. no, no. 1972. Yes. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Margaret Wise Brown was a little eccentric. She was known as an eccentric person with a complicated personal life, and she loved to recklessly spend money. Apparently, with her first advance check from writing, she bought an entire flower cart to decorate her apartment. And one time she sold full rights to one of her stories because she wanted enough money to buy a gray fox coat. She saw this coat and she didn't have enough money and so she just sold rights to one of her stories. She's like, here's my coat. So um, you weren't kidding when it's rich white lady shit. Rich white lady shit. Like, yeah, Don't, absolutely. I can't imagine that. <laughs> like, she, she was known by different names, by different circles of friends. To college friends, she was known as Tim due to her Timothy Hay colored hair. To her friends at Bank Street, they called her Brownie. So lots of different nicknames over her life. Like I mentioned before, she was fascinated with psychoanalysis and dream interpretation. She had a big heart on for Freud, how it goes at that time. But she also, you know, struggled with mental health and really deeply, deeply feeling when things happened in her life. Um, there was this, this 1946 Life magazine feature that I found that just kind of talked about her, like, pithiness and her kind of just weirdness. She would give answers to questions that kind of seemed like riddles. They wrote, if you ask Miss Brown what her hobby is, she will answer probably privacy. Um, I see or no like, problem with that. <laughs> right. That sounds fine to me. Like, <laughs> I would like, see the controversy. Yeah. Or like th somebody would ask her a weird, you know, a question and she'd give just like the weirdest answer. And so they also wrote, many a stranger afraid to ask her what the hell she was talking about has taken such a remark home for study under the impression that Miss Brown combines the best features of Dorothy Parker and Immanuel Kant. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of gives, gives you an idea. Is it possible she was trolling them just so that they wouldn't ask her any more questions? Like, I mean, the more nonsense I say, the more people will leave me alone. <laughs> I mean, maybe. That that does track. Um. <laughs> uh, so later in life, she wrote Mr. Dog, which is basically a thinly veiled autobiography featuring a pipe-smoking terrier dog who belonged to himself and went wherever he wanted to go. The dream. Yes, it is the, the dream. Yes. I mean, outside of the pipe-smoking, because, you know, I don't know about that part. But the dream <laughs> is just go wherever you want, be by yourself. Uh, she loved to escape the city, and she spent her summers writing 
on Vinyl Haven, which were dreamy islands off the coast of Maine. Yeah, she bought an abandoned quarry master's house there in 1943, which she called the only house. And it was, again, like just the best way I could describe this woman is just like rich white lady shit. She filled it with like weird stuff. It was kind of like, um, <laughs> it's like reminds me of like the Winchester Mystery House. <laughs> she framed windows like pictures. She sawed off legs of furniture because she had really low ceilings things would be too tall uh she installed an open air boudoir next to the outhouse which by the way this house had no plumbing or electricity and there was a door on the second floor that just opened up to the outside not to a balcony but just like if you opened the door and you walked through you would fall two stories to the ground i'm not seeing a problem with that i mean <laughs> this is before hgtv when people were willing to do what they wanted to their homes and not worry about what society said i mean crazy like rich white ladies are allowed to be eccentric this is what's expected of rich white ladies rich white ladies have rights too i mean this is the expectation is eccentricity exactly yeah. One time. So the, here's here's this handyman that uh, she stole her pseudonym from. There was one time in 1952 when this man, Golden or Goldie McDonald, rescued her and her fiance when their boat got caught in a squall. And I just wanted to put this story in because apparently Margaret Wise Brown was just continuing to smoke her pipe while the boat was sinking, like just sitting there, just like puff, puff, puff. Apparently Goldie fished them out and dragged them onto his boat with Brown's pipe still lit where he said, God, Margaret, you look better wet than dry. I and, and I feel like the pipe was helping her to stay calm in a tenuous situation. I don't know. It's just. I it's just, feel it's just like be, it's just. It's I just be, love that. It's, it's big dick energy. No, for me. it's just. I like. I was like, you know what? Like the boat's going down. What should we do? But I have this pipe. I might as well. I mean, <laughs> what can you do? A lot of her story ends up reminding me a lot of like Dolly Wilde and Natalie Clifford Barney. Same kind of vibes. Yeah, you like I'm something like unseekable Molly Brown energy. Kind of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she did have a messy love life. Several engagements and relationships that were fleeting and most of which never worked out. She was briefly engaged in college to a good, quiet man from Virginia. She had a long-running off-and-on affair starting around 1938 with the married playboy Bill Gaston in Vinyl Haven. He was a lawyer and playwright from a rich Boston family. So there's those elements of that upper class being expected to marry someone of your same station, but also rebelling against it because he was already married. Yeah, they had a long-running affair. In 1952, she met James Stillman, known as Pebble, was his nickname, Rockefeller Jr. He was the great nephew of J.D. Rockefeller. Okay. Um, he was 16 years younger than her. They met at a party and basically just got engaged right away. They planned to get married in Panama and sail around the world for their honeymoon on his boat, but Brown died before they could. And he's actually, I think he's still alive. He wrote a prologue for author Amy Gary's 2017 biography of Margaret Wise Brown saying, It has been 60 years since those days, but over half a century later, her light is burning ever brighter. Hmm. Margaret had a very complicated relationship with her career. She wanted to write real literature. Quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. it was like aiming to write for adults, but frequently felt niched into children's lit. So it's kind of felt like she had failed to grow up in her career. She said, I hope to write something serious one day as soon as I have something to say. But I am stuck in my childhood, and that raises the devil when one wants to move on. Yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting quote in terms of, you know, how much we talk about adulting and when you're an adult, putting away childish things. But now there's this movement of letting people like what they like as adults, even if it's childish. She sounds conflicted in a way that a lot of people are conflicted still today. Absolutely. She there was there was this one time where she wrote a letter to a college alumni newsletter in 1945. People were like kind of ragging on her for like not having any kids. And so she was like, how many children have you? I have 50 books, which I liked. Um, <laughs> but she also like as much as she like respected the mind of kids, she told Life magazine in an interview in 1946 kind of how she felt about kids as a whole. You'll see a lot of articles with titles like, you know, Margaret Wise Brown was a bisexual rebel who hated kids, which you know, I think is a, you know, I think is a little bit of a, uh, a little bit like condensed. 
So she has this quote uh, where she says, I don't especially like children, at least not as a group. I won't let anybody get away with anything just because he's little. So I think it's more that she she wasn't going to take any bullshit and she wasn't going to treat children like precious, breakable little playthings and was going to treat them more as little people who have complicated <laughs> lives. It's like the, and... just because you're a kid is not an excuse to be an asshole. It's like, right, like yeah. teach your kids better. <laughs> I don't. It feels contradictory because the previous quote talks about her being stuck in her childhood. This is yep. a very conflicted person. Very, very much. Very so. much conflicted. So she died, unfortunately, on November thirteenth, in nineteen fifty-two, at the age of forty-two, while on a book tour in Nice, France, from an embolism. She was recovering from surgery for appendicitis and kicked up her leg, can-can style, to show her nurses how well she was feeling, and that caused a blood clot in her leg to get dislodged and, unfortunately, travel to her heart. Yeah, what a way to go, though. Like, I'm good. Can can kick. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. She left over 70 unpublished manuscripts at her death. Her sister tried unsuccessfully to sell them and kept them in a trunk for decades until they were discovered by her biographer, Amy Grant, in 1991. And then Grant spent many, many years trying to get all of this together and get kind of more of her story out. Hmm. And her ashes were scattered at Only House on Vinyl Haven, her like favorite place in the world. Next, we have Anne M. Martin. And Anne was born August 12th, 1955 in Princeton, New Jersey. And Babysitter's Club. They're just giving away what she's famous for up front. Yeah, <laughs> because otherwise you wouldn't know what the yeah, fuck. But I, you get, I was building to it. Never mind now. It's out the club. Anne Martin wrote the Babysitter's Club books. Okay, there. Uh, in fact, she decided she wanted to be a teacher when she was a teenager, uh, specifically helping kids with disabilities. And for a time, she worked at a school for autistic children during the summer in high school. So education was always a big thing for her. I found this cute little one of those little scholastic middle school biography books called Anne M. Martin, The Story of the Author of the Babysitter's Club by Margot Becker that was published in 1993. And this is when the Babysitter's Club fandom was absolutely huge. And it's just got all these little facts that kids would like about the author. You know, kids love to grab onto random facts. Uh, like, for example, her middle initial M stands for Matthews, which is her mother's maiden name, and that she was born eight pounds, two ounces, which was considered big for her time, which I think is considered big for our time. I, yeah, I think that's considered big in general. Yeah. I was a I was a preemie and I was two pounds, 11 ounces when I was born. <laughs> so like, that's big to me. I don't know how big I was. I was born and then I was got bigger um, but i think that's generally how it works oh, i know i know i was born then i got bigger i don't know i think that's i think it's generally the trajectory i don't, I don't want to tell kids how to live their lives some choose not to grow <laughs> no. so, okay, so the reason i put this in here about the idea of the scholastic book being about ann martin as an author because it does kind of show that shift from when authors weren't mm. really well known by the public and all that mattered was what was on the page to this kind of shift where people started to want to learn more about the people who wrote the books mm -hmm. pre-social media. So that's why I like this book is that this is kind of that bridge between you're not just the author, you're also a person and people wanting to get to know the person. So, but yes, kids generally get bigger after they grow from being babies. <laughs> That is what this episode is about, I guess. Um, she went to Smith College and graduated in 1977, and her time at Smith influenced her her feminist identity, as it tends to do. Are there any straight people that have ever graduated from Smith? I don't know if I've met any. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they convinced themselves. I'm sure there are several straight people that have graduated from Smith, but there is that reputation and cliche. <laughs> are the straight people who have graduated from Smith here with us in the room right now. Um, anyway. Uh, you know you're after... going to get comments from people <laughs> like, I'm, I went to Smith. I'm straight. It's just a stereotype. And I just want to remind- Why are you listening to this podcast? I just want to remind that... people that this is not my show. So you direct all that to <laughs> Lee. Direct, yes. Write us at historyisgaypodcast at gmail.com if, uh, <laughs> if you're a heterosexual who graduated from Smith. Um, anyway- 
After Smith, she taught for two years before moving into publishing. She started as an editorial assistant and worked her way up to senior editor. And then starting around 1985, she wrote full time and worked as a freelance editor. Before the Babysitter's Club began in 1986, she wrote four books, a few of which won awards. And this was a fun little thing that I found. In 1990, she and her colleagues founded something called the Lisa Libraries, which was a nonprofit that they started to honor and memorialize one of their friends, Lisa Novak. And they would distribute books to kids and start libraries in underserved areas. Oh, and I just is, thought that that was a that is so really, sweet. Yeah, that was really lovely. That She's kind of always been really tuned into a lot of work in the community with kids. Yeah. So the Babysitter's Club is the one that she's most well known for. And we're going to talk about that. But before we do, there are some other series that Martin is known for. She's actually quite the prolific writer. So outside of that one, she's got something called The Kids in Miss Coleman's Class, which is a spinoff of the Babysitter Club Little Sister series. So it's a spinoff of a spinoff. There's one called The California Diaries which is about Dawn from the Babysitter's Club moving to California and becoming more of a teenager. There's a book series called Main Street, which was published from 2007 to 2011. There's a series called The Doll People, which is from 2000 to 2008. One called Family Tree, which is a short-lived one. And there's this more recent one called Missy Piggle Wiggle. I think these days she's like most well-known by kids at this generation for Missy Piggle Wiggle. Yeah, right? which I had never heard of, but apparently it's a very popular book at yeah. the elementary level. But let's talk about the thing that really is the reason why we're talking Anne Martin. Yeah. The Babysitter's Club, which was a series of books that started out in 1986 off of the suggestion of an editor. And its original run of books went from 1986 until 2000 and included several spinoff series, including uh, the Babysitter's Club Little Sisters books, which is actually how my little sister got into Babysitter's Club. And the Little Sisters were the first books I read when I stole her books. And then I went back and read the original Babysitter Club book. So, you know, I never read the Little Sister ones. I, I always just kind of stuck with the originals. Honestly, I mean, my history with Babysitter's Club was I, I read the books, but it wasn't until I saw the like movie in the 90s. The that theatrical like, one? Mm hmm. Yeah. Few, yeah. Yeah. So they've, they've been, you know, reimagined for more modern audiences with there's uh, there's been several that have been adapted into graphic novels. There was like a, a very short lived HBO slash Disney TV show in 1990. Which I remember then, loving. That was such a good yeah. show. And then there was a, a movie that was released in theaters in 1995 i very specifically remember watching that like it just it's like stuck into my brain i'm trying to remember some of the actresses oh i mean you know larissa was, uh, olenek from yeah there we go larissa olenek from the secret world of alex mack was in it you know she, i was just even looking at this too there was, was very very nickelodeon coded rachel lee cook mm -hmm. was in it you know uh, Skylar Fisk were in it. Those tend to be the three most famous of those. Yeah, in, uh, in 2020, Netflix released a new version of the show, but classic Netflix fashion. It was canceled only two seasons and 18 episodes, and I was very sad about it because I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, and you know, the modern interpretation of that Netflix did did cause its own controversy because it had the babysitters. One of the little girls that they babysat was trans. There was one family they babysat for where it was two gay dads. So it was definitely a more modern interpretation mm -hmm. in saying that families come in all shapes and sizes, which, you know, it's part of why a lot of us loved it and part of why, you know, haters are going to hate about it. But it was a huge thing and it really needed a couple more seasons and whatever. We know how Netflix does. According to the Babysitter's Club wiki, and I'm relying heavily on them for these numbers because these are the people that are most obsessed with this series. The Babysitter's Club in its original run had 131 titles in the main series, 122 titles in the Little Sister spinoff series. There were 36 mystery-oriented books about two dozen different types of special books. Because, you know, each Babysitter's Club book is told from the perspective of a specific babysitter. And in a lot of the special books, it was told from multiple babysitter perspectives. Um, yeah, it's like it's like the Megamorphs. Yeah, they're the Megamorphs. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so at one point, 
These books were so popular that Scholastic, the publishing company, was requesting up to 12 books a year or 12 books at a time to be written. Yeah, that that was pretty common. I mean, this is, you know, I've talked a lot about this when I've like talked about Animorphs is at this point of time, like in the early 90s, Scholastic was less a publishing house and more a pulp factory. These book authors crack for, these, for kids. Yeah, they these authors for these series, these big series that were middle grade readers, Babysitters Club, Boxcar Children, Sweet Valley uh, High, Animor- yeah. Sweet Valley High, Animorphs. Scholastic would order 12, 15 books at a time like these authors were required to be punching out books yeah. so quickly. And so much like many of these other series, Babysitters Club relied on the talents of ghost writers. Yeah. And this is the first person we're talking about who's actually dealing with chapter books. So yeah. these aren't just simple words and simple illustrations. We're talking a multi-chapter formula where you had to really flesh out the problem, flesh out the conflict, personalities of the babysitters. So yeah, ghost writers were a thing during some of it. And she's still... um she wrote the outlines, she did all the plotting, but the actual prose was written by ghostwriters for kind of like the latter half of the series, I'd probably say. She actually uh, has this interesting quote about kind of growing tired of the Babysitter's Club and feeling like she was in a rut, where she says, There was not a particular breaking point or one book, she says, but because the girls never aged, coming up with plots every fall as they re-entered eighth grade again began to feel a little bit old. You always want to write about your characters maturing or growing in some way. It wasn't exactly like pulling teeth, but it was coming close. And you can't see that's why a lot of those series that we mentioned earlier about the California Diaries was a chance to let these kids grow up a little bit. Yeah, and in 2003, she won the Newbery Honor for her novel, A Corner of the Universe. And much of her writing nowadays is standalone novels. I guess she, you know, had her fill of doing series upon series. And she frequently sets them in the 1960s. That's one of her her favorite settings, I guess. Yeah. And as of us recording this in 2024, she is 69 years old. Nice. And she's still writing... (laughs) I can't help it. Um, <laughs> I can't so, help it. She is a fairly private person with a quiet public life, really only engaging online a little bit with Facebook. But for the most part, she does life to live away from New York City, where she lived for many years. Now she lives in a small town in upstate New York, which I'm not going to mention, but it is outside of Woodstock. And she only comes to New York City kind of when she has to. But she does continue to do author appearances and collaborations, and she does approve of things like the reimagining with Netflix and the graphic novels. She is in favor of all of those things. And the thing that I found that I love the most about her is that part of the reason why she moved to the city, uh, she moved out of the city to the country, according to one interview, is that her dogs were too scared of the city and just preferred the countryside. Aww. So yeah, like she said, like, this just wasn't working for them. She has this great place in Greenwich Village, but her dogs wanted the space. And she says in the same interview, she's fostered hundreds of cats for the ASPCA. So she is a cat lady. Cat lady! <laughs> Yeah, I think I found like some really cute quotes about her kittens and you know she's just like, you know, I just adopt the most like hissy little baby kittens. It's it's very cute. It is very cute. All right. Our last person that we're going to cover in this episode is Arnold Lobel, who is one of my personal favorites. You may not know his name, but you certainly know his work. He is the person behind Frog and Toad, which has really, really, in the last couple of years, I've seen have really, really been fully embraced by the queer community. And I see them in a lot of beautiful content and memes. So Arnold was born May 22nd, 1933 in Los Angeles, but raised in Schenectady, New York by his German Jewish immigrant grandparents after his parents divorced in his early childhood. He was frequently bullied as a child, and so he spent a lot of his time at the local library reading. He started drawing during a period of extended illness when he was a kid that caused him to miss most of second grade. And actually, when he came back, like he was able to make friends in school by like showing them the cute animal drawings that he had drawn like when he was like home bed bound which was very cute oh yeah 
He also went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn with a fine arts degree, like Tommy. And they were there around the same time, actually. Yeah, he graduated in 1955. And he met his future wife, Anita Kempler, who was a fellow art student at Pratt. And they were married the same year that they graduated and they had two kids together. So from the start, he had goals of working as a children's book author and illustrator, but he wasn't able to support himself with any of these jobs after college. And he says, I cannot think of any work that could be more agreeable and fun than making books for children. And later described his job as a daydreamer. But In the world of reality, for the first several years after graduating, he did spend time working in advertising and then trade magazines, which he absolutely hated. He could not stand being in advertising. That was the epitome of, I just need a job out of college. But by the 1960s, the children's book scene had kind of expanded which provided him many more opportunities to kind of break into the scene. He gained some moderate success. He illustrated several of those um, easy readers. So if you remember those I Can Read books, they were all um, kind of like those. Yeah, they're all kind of like labeled for different ages and different age ranges for what the the like reading um, requirements are, etc. And he illustrated a bunch of fables and he started in 1961 as an illustrator for Harper and Row, working under... Ursula Ursula Nordstrom. Nordstrom. (laughs) Yeah. The first book that he actually wrote and illustrated was A Zoo for Mr. Muster in 1962. And he and his wife actually lived across from Prospect Park Zoo. And so a lot of his work actually featured whimsical animals from the start because, you know, that's what he was around. There is a a really wonderful quote from fellow children's author James Marshall, who is another person we're going to be covering in the next installation. So he wrote an obituary of Lobel, which I just, I thought this was just really fun to put in, like, as part of his personality. He wrote, Arnold and I only had one falling out, a serious one. It was so serious, I thought I was going to have to leave town. It occurred when I implied, not too subtly, that perhaps his beloved cat, Orson, was a bit on the dim side. Arnold's eyebrows hit the ceiling and his twinkling eyes turned to slits of rage. I changed the subject. (laughs) <laughs> people are so protective of their pets i know i love it <laughs> so lobel's big break came in 1970 with the publication of frog and toad are friends which is an immediate classic that was inspired by his childhood summers in vermont catching frogs and toads yeah he would when he was catching frogs and toads when he was a kid he would just like watch them and watch their differences and so the book series follows the adventures of frog and toad who are two neighbors and best friends and they're kind of like full foils and compliments of each other kind of like the sitcom of the oscar and felix oscar the... and felix yeah yeah it's yeah, yeah it, it reminds me a lot of like oscar and the odd felix. couple yeah yeah the, the odd couple there we go that's that's what i'm looking for yeah it reminds me a lot of the odd couple And Lobel viewed them as two aspects of himself. So you had, you know, Frog, who was like adventurous and outgoing, and Toad, who was a little bit bumbling and kind of, you know, more kept to himself. And it expanded into a series of four books that were published between 1970 and 1979. I think at this time, I want to admit something to you that I'm not sure how well you're going to take. I don't know the difference between a frog and a toad. And I have learned that fact several times. (laughs) and it just will not stick in my head, I don't know the difference. So Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know if you think less of me. I think that they are frogs uh, have moist, smooth skin, and toads have like bumpy, dry, wartier skin. I think frogs mostly, they're more in the water, and toads are, are drier. I will take your word for it. But I mean, but it, it is it is a little wibbly. Like I, I grew up on Ninja Turtles, so I know about turtles. <laughs> there are also bumpy frogs, like See, well then there's it's kind of wibbly. I just give up. See? This I don't get it. I will never understand it. <laughs> frogs are taller and they like to read in their house. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, Lowell would go on to illustrate nearly 100 books, many of which he also authored, but he did do a lot of illustrating of other people's works. Some of the other highlights outside of Frog and Toad are Mouse Soup from 1977, Fables 1980, for which he won a 1981 Caldecott Medal, 
and Owl at Home in 1975. And a lot of books he collaborated on with his wife, Anita. He won the Newbery Honor for Frog and Toad together in 1973. And themes in his work offered young readers reassurance and comfort and coziness. So, like, a lot of his stuff was just really cozy and gentle and, like, domestic. He wrote, I'm really a very domestic kind of person. There's a lot of furniture, a lot of accoutrement of the home, because that's what I am. I'm really not much of a traveler or wanderer or adventurer, and I think that feeling certainly comes into my books. He could also be a little bit cheeky, though. I like how he approached Random House's book of Mother Goose in 1986. Uh, He said, I hadn't been too pleased with the way Mother Goose had been handled by its recent interpreters. So polite, so genteel, so well behaved. My concept of Mother Goose is just the opposite. Body and naughty. So... (laughs) It's adorable. He always felt that he was more inclined towards illustrating than writing. And he says, writing is very painful to me. I have to force myself not to think in visual terms because I know if I start to think of pictures, I'll cap out on the text. And that's from a 1979 interview. And in a 1977 interview, he explained that he came up with his ideas by imagining what children would want to read. But later in his life, he started tapping more into his own experiences and emotions for more weight in his writing. And he said that he was writing, quote, adult stories slightly disguised as children's stories, which I think is really important once we get into talking about Frog and Toad and, you know, what we're going to talk about in our, our next Why Do We Think They're Gay section. As for his later life and death, um, he separated from his wife, Anita, in the 1980s and continued to illustrate and write books until his death, which he passed away December 4th, 1987. And it was listed in his obituary that his death was the result of cardiac arrest at the age of 54. And uh, he had one final book that was published posthumously in 1988 called The Turnaround Wind. So young. Yeah. Yeah. Between him and Margaret Wise Brown. And one of the one of the other people that we're going to be talking about in in one of the next episodes is Louise Fitzhugh, who did um, Harry the Spy. She also died pretty young. Mm. All right. So let's move into our why do we think they're gay section. Surprise. All the people we're talking about are queer. All your children's book favorites were written by queer people. So let's talk about queer identity and queer themes in work for all of these lovely folks. So going back to Tommy DePaola, he came out late in life. And I really worked hard to try to find a specific interview where he talked about his sexuality. But the first one I found wasn't even until 2019 in a New York Times interview. Uh, And that's like the first public acknowledgement, even though it was pretty well known among his friends and families and his circle of friends. He was briefly married to a woman in the 1960s, but that didn't last long. But You also see hints of it as far as when he came out. Like, I can't find specifically when he came out, but there is a 1999 New York Times interview where he said, I try to bring values into my work. He cited one of his more famous books, Oliver Button is a Sissy, as an example of children being ostracized by peers. And he says, this story is based on an event from his early life when he was an avid tap dancer. So depending on how you look at that 1999 interview, whether he talked about being bullied as opposed to the 2019 interview when he was talking about specifically being gay. Yeah, apparently Oliver Button is a sissy was like the closest any children's book got at the time to using the word gay. Sissy was the closest thing you could. He said, I was called sissy in my young life, but instead of internalizing these painful experiences, I externalized them in my work. Yeah. In the same New York Times article, he spoke about how as a kid, he insisted on carrying his tap shoes over his shoulder and his father used to be upset about it. He would like sling sling them over his shoulder. Like that classic, you know, tie the shoelaces and sling them there. But when he... Real fay. (laughs) But when he began appearing in school performances, the teasing stopped and his father took pride in his ability to entertain. He retells that experience in the Oliver Button book. So when talking about being a gay writer in the mid 20th century, in the 2019 New York Times interview, he said, if it became known you were gay, you'd have a big red G on your chest and schools wouldn't buy your books anymore. 
So by 2019, he was open. He was talking about it fairly openly. Well, but that's also like, I mean, that one line is pretty much all I could find, right? Like that's that's essentially him coming out. And that was basically a year before he died. So that's yeah. really late in his life. Yeah. So a lot of these, I mean, we're going to see it with Maurice Sendak when we talk about him in our next one as well. A lot of these folks being gay was just a part of their life that was for them and for the people in their lives. And they did not come out until much, much later publicly. And a lot of them was just like, oh, yeah, I'm gay. And like, that's what we've got. <laughs> like, we've got a line. And you have your friends and family knew about it. But because they're friends and family, they're not running to the media. Right. And they're yeah. not trying to expose anybody. It's just a well-known accepted thing among close friends and family. Yeah. I think that's in some ways kind of what makes finding out about these authors kind of so special is that we all grew up with these people in our homes, essentially, in, in these books. And we're inherently just like so tied into our childhoods. And so then finding out as a queer adult, oh, this person was gay. This person was family is just I think that there's really something delightful about that is like a feels like a hidden treasure. Yeah. So with Tommy's work and some of the queerness and themes in his work, when he was in San Francisco, part of what he gained was this more awareness of the anti-war slash peace movements, war awareness of women's issues. And he says that this raised his consciousness frequently. And he put that in his stories several times. This idea of peace and love and gender equality. Going back to Oliver Button is a Sissy, which is, you know, that more autobiographical book. Oliver is a boy that is bullied by his classmates for being different. He likes to pick flowers. He likes to walk in the woods, play with dolls, jump rope. He likes to play dress up. And his father wanted him not to be a Sissy and will often tell him to go outside and play sports, which Oliver didn't take to. So his parents enrolled him in dance for exercise, and Oliver took a liking to it, especially tap, which caused more teasing from kids at school until some of the girls stuck up for him a bit. But the boys still called him a sissy. There was still graffiti on the walls saying Oliver Button is a sissy until one day he tapped at a community dance talent show. And his parents were proud of him, and he got a great reception by the community. And so he went back to school on Monday, and the graffiti was changed from Oliver Button is a sissy to Oliver Button is a star. So mm. yay for that. But at the same time, like, you can still see, like, sissy is sissy's not gone. It's still there. It's just crossed out, but underneath it, you know. Yeah, I don't know. There's something there that's really interesting. Of That is still there. Under the surface of it all. Under the surface, yeah. And it shows that difficulty where it's not enough to be yourself to be accepted. You have to be exceptional in a way that becomes more important than who you are as your individual traits. It's having to have that special talent. And you could see that push and pull, which there are a lot of YouTube videos of different people reading this book. A lot of uh, queer actors, a lot of stage theater people reading this story, especially during COVID when a lot of people started reading children's books on YouTube. This is a fairly popular one. And in fact, it's actually kind of become a mini iconic book in the queer community. I mean, it's a short picture book, but they actually adapted it into a 30 minute musical. Wow. Kind of a semi stage where they're singing and acting it out, but it's like not a full musical. And that is hugely popular with queer choruses and queer theater groups around the country. So that's a more recent that. thing. Yeah, since 2003. So you're kind of expanding on the different motifs in it. In 2007, it was adapted into a documentary called Oliver Button is a Star, which I think is also available, like you could find it like on Vimeo or something, which was teaching kids about anti-bullying and celebrating differences. So this is one of the few Tommy DePaola books that's very explicit, if you will, and that's really been embraced by the queer community in different formats. Yeah, again, like this is like the closest you could get in, was it 1979 is when Oliver Button is a sissy? Is yeah. Yeah, 79. Yeah. yeah. Which also 10 years after John Donovan's YA novel. So it, I think it really also goes to show like how, how much stronger the barrier is between young adults slash early adult novels to children's literature and that really strict like, nope, that is not content for these kids at this age at all. Yeah. And everything has to be really, really couched in in metaphor. Yeah. And I could be wrong because there are 26 episodes of the show, but in looking at that TV show he did, 
I don't think Oliver Button is a book that was mentioned in any of those episodes. I could be wrong. Really? I haven't like, watched all of them, but I don't think this is one of those that made that leap to live action Muppet, if you will. Wow. So I could be wrong, but I haven't seen them all, but I don't think it did. All right, so onward to Margaret Wise Brown. So we have a lot more from her life about her queer identity. Her diaries from boarding school in Switzerland and Massachusetts feature declarations of love for female friends. She never really was interested so much in having children. She and John Rockefeller, Pebble Rockefeller, um, had briefly considered having kids, but in an interview with Pebble, he mentioned she was so full in her own life, and yet there must have been a lack somewhere along the line. But whether she would like an ordinary marriage with children, I just couldn't really see her in that. So, you know, we talked about her, like, sort of messy love life. What happened with her love life in that 10 years between meeting Bill Gaston, that she, this married man that she had this long, long affair with, and when she met Rockefeller very shortly before she died. What happened was one of her longest, most tumultuous and prolific romances with a woman. So she met this woman named Blanche Ulrichs, who was mostly known by her pen name, Michael Strange. She was 20 years older than Margaret. She was a socialite, poet, playwright, actress. And they met in 1940. Michael was also dubbed uh, the Sappho of Long Island. (laughs) She had been married and divorced three times, including to popular stage actor John Barrymore. And she became a huge name because of that. She first used this pen name, Michael Strange, to publish her books of erotic poetry, much of which was about John Barrymore, without like endangering her reputation and her relationship with her very rich upper class family. But very soon, she just adopted it as her entire persona. She was using it in her personal life, everyday life, in her dress. She just became Michael Strange. She was a member of the Lucy Stone League, which was a women's suffrage organization, and she was also a registered communist. She and Margaret were introduced by Bill Gaston. Strange was a lover of his at the time, too, and apparently they met when um, Margaret was uh, rowing rowing a boat to his cottage on the island and uh, walked in and found them sunbathing together and were like, hello, come join us. Uh, Their relationship started as like a mentorship, but it soon became romantic. Yeah. So uh, biographer Amy Grant described Strange as everything Margaret wished she could be, outspoken, sophisticated, and sure of herself. Although Strange herself was unhappily married to her third husband, who found out about the relationship between the two and threatened to institutionalize Strange. Yeah, Strange. There's a story I found about how Michael Strange called Margaret Wise Brown in a panic one night and basically said, get in a taxi, come over as soon as you can, because her husband found out about their relationship and was like, this is sick and I'm calling a doctor right now to diagnose you because... It was very, very dangerous and illegal at that time to be queer. And institutionalization was not uncommon. Yes. And so basically, at this point, she calls Margaret in a panic. Margaret gets a taxi, and with the help of a maid, Michael slipped out the back staircase and into the taxi, and they drove away. And they're just kind of driving around New York City late at night trying to figure out what to do. Soon after, Michael Strange calls her husband to demand a formal apology and officially started the process for separation. And at that point, Michael and Margaret were like inseparable. They spent much of their time together in like women's clubs, sharing cocktails. They, you know, had classic gay nightlife together. Yeah. Brown went right in her diaries that walking with Strange in New York at night was a heightened experience. And in the classic, you know, lesbian, bisexual world that you see, Brown moved into an apartment across the hall from Strange at 10 Gracie Square in the Upper East Side, which allowed them to basically live together, visiting each other constantly, while also having that separate space required by law. And just in case anything came up, uh, they They even even had a shared shared butler. butler. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. They also at times lived in, Margaret had like a 19th century converted farmhouse that she turned into like a writing studio that they would live in together on and off. 
So the relationship itself was quite intense and a bit tumultuous. Strange insisted that they use coded language in their letters to each other, and uh, both internal and externalized homophobia affected their relationship. Michael wrote intense love letters and declared intense love until her dying day and that she would, you know, she'd never met anybody like Margaret and she never would love anybody like Margaret again. She would give gifts, but she could also be very cruel and jealous and mocking. She would deride Margaret's speaking mannerisms and write off her interests like psychoanalysis. She made Margaret feel really needy. I mean, this is very, this reminds me a lot of like Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West and Dolly Wilde and Natalie Clifford Barney. She was really kind of petty and jealous uh, and insecure about Margaret's success. She hadn't published a poem in like a decade and felt washed up. And so, you know, she really, I think, felt intimidated by the fact that her partner was really blowing up. But she also didn't help with Brown's insecurities about her career. We talked a little bit before about how she was feeling like she was stuck and she didn't really like writing kids literature and she wasn't writing real literature. And so Michael Strange would say things, you know, like she would dismiss Brown's work as silly, furry stories, which I'm sure didn't feel super great. So Goodnight Moon itself was inspired partly by their relationship. After a breakup and recovering from a surgery, uh, Margaret Wise Brown wrote a poem in Vinyl Haven about a girl who moved from the country to the city and comforted herself by imagining her old room. The poem came back to her in a dream years later, mixed with the color palette of her downstairs neighbor's apartment. And she painted her bedroom that color scheme. So... You could see that kind of semi-autobiographical aspect of it. Yeah. And there have been people who have analyzed like the runaway bunny kind of posited that there were some aspects of Michael and Margaret's relationship in that. Margaret wrote several poems during their stormy relationship to kind of process everything. All throughout like World War II, there's a huge amount of poems between them. And there was kind of further drama between them when Strange's health began to deteriorate starting in 1948. So they kind of had a really whirlwind, long-term romance, and then things really started kind of deteriorating. Strange collapsed at a hotel while on the road for a show, and she was told it was exhaustion, but it actually turned out to be leukemia, and she was given one year to live. And at this point, Michael Strange is panicking, and she declares their relationship a sin. She says that that caused her to become sick. She blamed their relationship and their, their quote-unquote sinful behavior for her cancer. And she, at this point, demands that Margaret moves out. Hmm. Margaret sent letters begging for them to stay together. She promised to care for her through her illness. You know, she was kind of doing everything she could. But Michael was insisting that the physical relationship had siphoned her health and she refused to see Margaret. And Margaret was kind of left with the only option to continue to have Michael Strange in her life would be a platonic friendship and through sending letters. So like the latter part of their relationship and their lives together was really epistolary. Yeah. And all of this kind of rejection and strange pushing Margaret away took a, quite the toll on her. Uh, Margaret's mental health suffered greatly during this time. She contemplated the idea of suicide. And if you read her letters after this, she promises to be less needy, promises to be more independent. And that only seemed to make things worse with Michael asking eventually for no contact. Yeah. I found this one story about how at so so Michael Strange is, you know, sick, but she's still trying to push forward and and trying to still perform. And so she does this final stop on her final goodbye tour. And by this point, you know, they've gone kind of no contact. And Margaret learned that tickets for the show weren't selling. And so she bought multiple rows of empty seats and brought friends on board, as well as Michael's daughter, who Margaret had gotten pretty close with, and they kind of commiserated a lot together over Michael's attitude and stubbornness and illness. And, you know, they, they filled all of these seats so that Strange wouldn't have to perform to a half-empty house. And she, like, left a bouquet of flowers in Strange's dressing room. And Michael sent a messenger to thank Margaret for the flowers, but it became really complicated. She basically said, you have to stay away from me. 
And in kind of a, you know, like manipulative kind of thing, she basically says, like, listen, if you can comply, if you can, like, leave me the fuck alone, then we might have a future relationship. She's kind of, like, dangling this carrot. And it's it sucks because it's, like, awful and it's, uh, heartbreaking. Kind and of toxic. Yeah. And toxic. But also, a lot of this is coming out of this woman's, like, I'm dying and I need to do what I need to do because I'm dying and I can't handle this. I mean, it's it's natural for several, you know, it's, it's natural for people when they're dying. You know, some people will draw family in closer. Some people will push people away. Yeah. So that in and of itself is quite natural, is, is, a, is a natural response. But it also shows the kind of power dynamics within that relationship. Yeah. So Strange went to Switzerland for an experimental treatment and Margaret contacted Strange's daughter to be like, where is she? Get me in contact with her. And they started writing letters again. And Margaret actually ended up flying to Switzerland. But the doctor was ordering Margaret to stay away, saying that their relationship was causing Michael Strange stress and Strange needed to eliminate stress if she was going to have any chance at uh, going into remission. And so she was like in a hotel and she was trying to stay there for a little while until Michael changed her mind, hoping that she would change her mind. And she didn't. And so she ended up going back to New York City. Um, so Michael Strange returns to New York City after the Swiss clinic treatment failed. And at this point, finally relented and started letting Margaret take care of her. And in kind of an irony of ironies, these like silly furry stories that she often dismissed were some of the things that really kept her spirits up while she was basically dying basically dying yeah and the, the two of them ended up actually collaborating on a small series on a small book series about two bunnies living together um and so the characters and nicknames for them were rabbit md and bunny no good so when michael ended up having to be hospitalized margaret rented a hotel room across the street and brought her flowers and kept a vigil outside of her room after the homophobic doctors forbade her from actually visiting during the day, if you will. So Yeah, like they wouldn't let her in the room. Yeah, so if you can imagine being so close to your loved one but not being able to be physically in the room to comfort them. And we know that that is something that thousands of queer couples have had to go through, being kept out of it. Mm -hmm. um, on her deathbed, uh, Strange actually called out for my, for Margaret. But the doctors refused to let her enter until after they thought she had passed. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really awful. Basically, uh, finally, like a nurse opens the door and lets Margaret in. And Margaret came in and she closed and kissed Michael's eyes and was saying goodbye to her. She held her hand and she actually felt her squeeze back in her final moments. And she promised to read Michael's poetry each morning from then on to kind of keep her alive in her memory. So Strange died on November 5th, 1950, and Margaret was actually made her literary executor. But then when Margaret died two years later, Strange's papers were actually delivered to Margaret's sister, who then contacted Michael Strange's daughter, who basically just said, burn them. She had a really, really complicated relationship with her mother. Before Michael died, Margaret had considered writing a biography about their relationship, and she wrote of Michael in her diary, basically described her as, quote, one who has dared to be gloriously good and gloriously bad in one life. No limbo for her. Hmm. And to kind of close out Margaret Wise Brown, I was able to find a couple of the poems that she had written about or for Michael. And so we wanted to read just a couple of those before we move on to Anne M. Martin and Arnold Lobel, and then we'll close out the episode. So this is an excerpt from That's the Way Things Are. When first we met, I never, never, never knew that I was meeting you. Then something hit me suddenly, sudden as a shooting star. I felt things beating eight to the bar, and that's the way things are. You may be wild, you may be witty, and you can't even drive a car. I'll never let you drive my car, but you're my only girl and mighty pretty, and that's the way things are. Mm. It's very, um, very Asami Sato coded there. All right. Uh, we also have, could I tell you that I love you? Could I tell you that I love you and never say it so? Could I show you that I love you without the out the outward show? And then you smile because you know. 
Just mm. a little one there. Yeah. And then we have one once Michael had gotten sick and shortly before she passed away called To a Friend Departing in Time. Could I write before you go but one verse who loved you so? But one verse that you should know how I love you ere you go. I would write it in a rhyme that would ring beyond our time, that would keep this moment clear, far beyond our little year. But this I cannot write, my dear, so I write before you go all these words who loved you so. That's quite beautiful. Yeah. She, she, I mean, she really had a gift. I, I wish that we had been able to see some some of the adult work that Margaret was hoping to do in her lifetime. Instead she of just died. being known as the children's author. Right. And she, and she just, she died so young. So I can't imagine what she would have been able to do had she lived into her 70s, 80s. Yeah. So looking at Anne Martin, uh, let's talk a bit about Martin's queer identity. In 2016, at the age of 61, in a New York Magazine slash Vulture interview, Anne Martin came out in a one-sentence line about her non-Babysitter's Club work. And it's not even so much that it's her line, it is what the writer of the piece said. Said, with her partner at the time, Laura Godwin, which they've since broken up, she wrote four doll people books, which were tales of what a child's doll collection does when no one's watching. And that's all that's actually there in terms of that article about Martin being connected to Laura. And it's not even about any kind of coming out. It's just about these book series that they wrote together. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a blink and you miss it. I had to go back and read this interview multiple times because I kept reading reaction essays about how this magazine mentioned that Martin was a lesbian. And I'm going, how am I missing it? I know I'm reading this quickly, right. but where is this at? And that was the line, the fact that she wrote these books with her partner at the time. Yeah, so, well, and it's like, even when we were when we were first thinking about doing this episode, we were like, oh, we got to put Anna and Martin on the list. She did Babysitter's Club and she's apparently gay because it's just something that like I had found out at some point and knew. But that seems yeah. to be the thing of like, it was mentioned once and then the entire world was like, hey, did you know that the Babysitter's Club is gay? It's one of those words, like, it's one thing to know it, but being a history research-based show, it's one thing to be able to prove it. Right. And actually yeah. provide that evidence. <laughs> um, so according to Heather Hogan, who writes in an autostraddle essay about this New York Times interview, there have been rumors circulating in the New York literary scene about Martin's queerness for years. Apparently, this is one of those open secrets, if you will. And even that is hard to corroborate. Uh, Hogan has to go to a 2007 live journal post oh, on a live journal blog by the user Bartzina13 on the No They Didn't Gossip blog. So think how far we're... For Oh No They Didn't. Right? So look how far blog. we're moving away from actual confirmed research. <laughs> like, you know, Oh No They Didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember Oh No They Didn't. I remember that life. I remember that LJ. <laughs> okay. So, like, according to this 2007 blog post, it goes, It is confirmed that Anne M. Martin is a lesbian. She is out in the literary community and has taken her partner with her to events, including when she's spoken at Smith College, her alma mater. That in and of itself isn't evidence, <laughs> but it goes to a different post or a comment on a post where someone had posted, and this is like degrees of separation, someone had posted that they had a professor in a children's literature class and the professor mentioned knowing Martin from writing conferences and the professor mentioned Martin lived with a woman and sometimes brought her partner along to events. So it's an unconfirmed, unsourced, random comment by a student in a class referencing a professor's story. And I am a professor and I say all kinds of stories in class, <laughs> half of which are not true. Like I've claimed for years Barack Obama's my cousin. So half my <laughs> stories are not even true. So Aubrey is... out here just lying bald faced to her students. I've been teaching for 20 years. The lies are better than my real life. They are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But that's like not exactly journalism or research. But the rumor was there tw back in 2007 before we got the confirmation in 2016. But yes, you know, look, all the best professors lie. I mean, honestly, if I could make up a lie or a story to get the point across, I'm going to do that more than go with reality if it gets the main <laughs> point across. But that's just called teaching. 
Oh, man. So, but it's just not something that's talked about by Martin yeah. herself, but apparently people have known. I mean, I think that what is more significant to get into, I mean, it's, it is clear, like, she is a lesbian. She has had a partner. That is fact enough. That's really all we need. But I think what's really interesting is the way that Babysitter's Club has been a fixture in queer fandom yeah. for so long. If anything, the impact of the work outshines the individual writer herself. Right. Yeah. And so Carmen Phillips, another writer for Otter Straddle, once wrote that Babysitter's Club is well known for being, quote, beloved by lesbian, bisexual and queer women who grew up seeing themselves in these scrappy young girls who never took no for an answer. And so the book series is, let's be very, very clear. The book series is very heterosexual. Yes. It is like, which it had to be at the time. But like, I mean, we're talking 80s, 90s, 80s, 90s, eighth graders, like perpetual eighth graders. Yeah. Yeah. Girls babysitting, babies, boys, boyfriends, etc. But at the heart of it, it's this series that prioritized friendships between these different teen girls, for the most part, over boys, right? And I, I say for the most part, looking at you, Stacy, boy crazy. Stop throwing shade at a fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not throwing shade. I'm just saying she's described she's the boy crazy as one. Yes. boy crazy. Yes. Um, but I think it, it really resonated with queer readers. I mean, for the longest time, I've known of several queer authors who somebody like Shannon Waters, who is pretty well known in like the comics world has done queer fanzines about babysitters club you also have you know one of the primary characters the very first babysitters club book is chrissy's great idea the protagonist is chrissy thomas who if any of them are going to be queer it's christy thomas you know she's a tomboy she came up with the idea for the club she's described as like would rather get head lice than kiss a boy. Very, very queer coded. And that, you know, kind of, I think, really resonated with queer readers. Journalist Joy Ellison wrote in a, an article in Columbus Monthly in 2020, quote, The Babysitter's Club was set in a white suburban nightmare of heterosexual happiness and babies, babies, babies. Nonetheless, there is evidence of Martin's queerness on every page. The Babysitter's Club books let readers revel in a world that placed girls at its center. Their club meetings were tiny feminist utopias. Yeah, so like it's there in the celebration of women being at the center of things, even though, I mean, it's published by Scholastic. And I mentioned earlier how I used to read my sister's books, but, you know, I read those in secret. Before right. I'd come out as trans, when I was a teenager, and all of my friend groups have always been predominantly female. That's always been where I had always been more comfortable, but where I explored a lot of my gender identity and sexuality was through books. And so I secretly wanted to be a part of this group. I wanted to read these books, and I did, but I didn't want anybody to know about it yet. So there's definitely that feeling of, here's a club that I wanted to be a part of. Yeah. And I mean, could they have been more gay? Yeah. You know, but like, would they have could... gotten published? No. <laughs> I mean, exactly. it's like, like, would they have gotten published is the thing. Yeah. Where I get more disappointed is like, as much as I love the new Netflix adaptation of Babysitter's Club, like, y'all chickened out. Give us unambiguously gay Christy. Maybe you know? that, that wasn't th that was in the season three we never got. Yeah, maybe. Because, you know, that was like they did like the first establishing it. And there's this great documentary about how important Claudia Kishi is as, represent mm. as Asian representation yeah. and how she didn't fit that stereotype, that perfect academically oriented like Claudia's an artist. So yeah. season three would have been, you know, Christy, you know coming out but then netflix we, canceled we, yeah, it. Can that's only... my f that's fan don't that's not like you know, <laughs> we can my, we can only we no. can only cross our fingers my fan imagining is that season three would have been christy realizes that she likes you know <laughs> so christy realizes she's got a huge crush on uh you know christy discovers phoebe bridgers or <laughs> <laughs> christy discovers king princess <laughs> <laughs> the, the unpublished Babysitter's Club. Chrissy's Great Awakening. <laughs> right? Yeah. Instead of Chrissy's Great Idea, Chrissy's Great Awakening. Chrissy's Great Awakening. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Okay. Uh, last on one. Moving on. Last one. Arnold Lobel. <laughs> um, so our beloved frog and toad gentleman came out to his wife and children in 1974, but he never publicly spoke about his homosexuality. 
I thought this was really cute that like, you know, he came out to his wife and children in the 70s and realized that he was gay, but he and his wife Anita continued to work together after he came out and after they separated in the 1980s. So like, it was one of these really like kind of wholesome, yay, good, like we still love each other and care about each other. We just have realized that you're my beard. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you do hear those stories about, you know, one person comes out as gay, how the ex becomes their biggest supporter. You know, like mm-hmm. that friendship's still there. That bond is still there. It's just different. So plus, I mean, they continue to work together. You can't mess with the money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Arnold met his partner, Howard Wiener, in 1979 and moved to Greenwich Village with him. And they would live together until Lobel's death. And Frog and Toad was written in some ways as a way to start coming out. Basically, it really helped Lobel come to terms with his own identity. Lobel's daughter, Adrienne, has said in multiple interviews that she believes Frog and Toad are friends was the beginning of him coming out both to himself and others and to his network. She's quoted as saying, It was the only thing he wrote that involved a relationship. I've watched children grow up and that whole drama that's kind of the precursor to the hell of romance later in life. Who is best friends with whom and who likes who when and this person doesn't like me now. It's very painful and I think that children really like to hear that this is not abnormal. That Frog and Toad go through these dramas every day. And she also says that Frog and Toad, quote, are of the same sex and they love each other. It was quite ahead of its time in that respect. Lobel himself never talked publicly about the connection between his sexuality and Frog and Toad, but did comment on how his own personal experiences and emotions made their way into the series. And he says, When I first started writing, I would begin by writing stories for children that were really outside my own feelings. But with Frog and Toad stories, he looked deeper within himself and he tapped into his own emotions. Um, He said, you know, if an adult has an unhappy love affair, he writes about it. He exorcises it out of himself, perhaps, by writing a novel about it. Well, if I have an unhappy love affair, I have to somehow use all that pain and suffering, but turn it into a work for children. Hmm. So he really, this this kind of went through what he had mentioned in later life. He was really kind of tapping into his own emotions and experiences in his writing. Yeah. What's really significant is that Howard, Howard yeah. yeah, Howard cared for Lobel at the end of his life. And we mentioned up above that the New York Times obituary listed his cause of death as cardiac arrest. But they deliberately had this very glaring omission because Lobel had been suffering from AIDS for some time and his death was actually from complications related to the disease. So this was at a time he passed away at the height of the AIDS crisis. I mean, this was 87, so... Yeah, 87, height of the AIDS crisis. He had never come out publicly. And this was something that was very, very common. Many, many people were recorded in their, like, official obituaries as causes of death that were related to AIDS, but AIDS or HIV was never mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. So Lobel has a square on the AIDS quilt that was designed by California school children who love Frog and Toad, which having seen the AIDS quilt a couple times in person, Mm -hmm. that kind of small tribute just can mean so much, you know? His final posthumously published book may have been an allegory for the effect of the AIDS crisis. A sudden dark storm comes and turns a whole community upside down and causes chaos. And I just wanted to kind of leave this on... Another quote from James Marshall, which we quoted from before, he wrote a separate obituary for Lobel and very specifically mentioned Howard Wiener. He wrote, Arnold asked me to thank Howard Wiener, who took such good care of him at the end, and he asked me to say this. Tell them, he said, that if they wish to do something nice for me, ask them to look at the books, because that's where they'll find me. Mm, It's very sweet, very sad, but... Very poetic. I find it interesting that Lobel is the only person we've looked at who actually had children. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's amazing how many people, you know, these children's writers either didn't want to or weren't able to have that aspect of having those kids that they would read the books to. I mean, I can, t- you know, my, with my kid now being 14, reading to them was some of my favorite parts of yeah. having a little one. I mean, that's some of my, the things I never got tired of was reading different books and taking them to the library and story times and exploring. So it's kind of sad that they never, if they wanted kids, I don't know, a lot of people don't want kids, you know, which I totally get, um, you know, <laughs> but if they wanted kids, a lot of them weren't able to experience the joy of having that kid 
and exposing them to the wonderful books and reading. So Yeah, absolutely. But I'm a sentimental softy and you know, <laughs> my world is my kid and my wife anyway, so I'm Aww, sentimental. <laughs> I love it. Well, there you have it. There is our first roundup of queer classic children's authors. The end of this episode is going to be a little different. We are going to hold off on our pop culture tie-ins and how gay were they ratings until we are done because we've got more folks to talk about. So we're going to come back next episode with some additional folks, including James Marshall, Maurice Sendak of Where the Wild Things Are fame. We're going to talk about Tove Janssen, who uh, wrote the Moomin series. And last but not least, Louise Fitzhugh the wonderful uh, lesbian behind Harriet the Spy. So thank you so much for joining us. We will be right back in your ears with part two. In the meantime, Aubrey, where can people find you and more of your work? Well, you could find me on Instagram. I'm at Aubrey Calvin and Aubrey is spelled A-U-B-R-E-E. And then I also have my own podcast with my co-host India called Southern Queries, where we look at queer life in the South. And I'm Lee Pfeffer. When I'm not nerding out about old-timey queer folks, I'm usually talking comics and queer TV over at A Paradox in Flux on Twitter. Sort of almost never on there anymore because it's a garbage site. And, you know, hanging out, crying about Xena episodes on my couch. History is Gay podcast can be found on Tumblr at History is Gay podcast, Twitter and Instagram at History is Gay pod. And you can always drop us a line with questions, suggestions, or just to say hi at History is Gay podcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show and want to support us in continuing to make it, you can support us on our Patreon. As a patron, you can get access to our secret Discord server, Sappho Salon Minisodes, where we'll treat you to love letters and poems from queer historical faves, pop culture tie-in live watches, and queer history trivia nights, exclusive merch, and more. You can become a patron by going to the support section on our website or patreon.com slash historyisgay and join the ranks of our patron community along with the amazing Lee, Bridget, Jenna Magnuski, August Red, Theoprecht, and Ash Jimbo. There are more of you, but we will be shouting you out in the next one. Thank you all for your support. You can also get merch on the History is Gay store. Click on shop at our website. And lastly, remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It helps more people find the show, and we can expand our awesome community. Until we get to our, our part two episode, that's it for History is Gay. Until next time, stay queer and stay curious. Bye.